as you remember, we have been talking about what it means to be fulfilled. And we can fill ourselves with many things. We can choose to use good food or we can use junk food and we will be feeling filled up, but it's not going to be the same results at the end. And um, what we are learning in this is that also spiritually and emotionally, we can fill our lives with many things. But at the end of the day, we need to explore, is it what I'm using, what I'm accepting in my life, really being able to fulfill me in a way that is not just for now, but has an eternal consequence or not. We learned last week and in two weeks ago, we learned about how, what is the first thing that God gives to all of us. And the very first thing is his name. He says, I am. And by telling us that, we learn that the God that we have is a God who has been in the past, is now with us, and will be in the future. It gives us that consistency. That's one of the most beautiful gifts from God, knowing that he's always there and he's available for all of us. We also learn about consecrate, and we try to clarify that concept. Many times when we think about consecrating, we thought, if something I need to do or stop doing, well, actually, to consecrate means receiving and receiving from God and receiving a special place. And he's equipping me so that I can serve. And last week, we talked about memories. We remember about Caleb. And Caleb was able to say, you know, we can conquer that place because I know the God that is going to lead us. I remember what God has been doing with us and through all of us. And in that, we also study about what the scripture says in 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through what? Our faith. It's through what we remember. It's through what we are connecting with God. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Those who have that experience with the Lord. It's not about your capacity or your qualities or your agenda. It's about that we recognize and accept who is the Lord and who we are in Him. Today, we're going to learn a new word. And this word is to dedicate, to dedicate. And it's part of the same fulfilling, to dedicate. I like the different uh, ways that they interpret this word in here. It says to devote, consecrate, to bless, or to commit pledge or to sanctify, that is to dedicate. And what we are going to learn today is about the Nazareth vow and how it was a dedication of your life to the Lord. We can use this word in many ways. Some of them are a little bit simpler than others. To dedicate. If any of you have ever been in contact with a Mexican grandmother, there is something that a Mexican grandmother always dedicate. And let me tell you what it is. They dedicate some dish called cazuela, and that is kind of the, the, the clay, um, how can I call it, dish, yeah, that they cook the rice. And in any uh, Hispanic family, you will know with the grandmothers that there is one specific cazuela, that that's the one they always cook the rice. And for some reason, this, the clay on those is so unique that you can put it in the microwave, in the oven or so, and they cook different the flavor. I don't know if they have that also in Cuba. Uh, it's just a Mexican thing. Glory to the Lord. Okay, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, one of the things, now I want the right. And, uh, but what? do not touch the cazuela. If you have done the mistake I did when I thought, oh, it's too dirty or too ugly, let's throw it. Big mistake, right? Because they will go. And they will hunt for it in the trash and bring it back. Because like that is dedicated for that specific thing. So we dedicate certain things. We dedicate also our time. We dedicate lives with each other. For example, this picture was taken, took, uh, it took 18 years ago in a galaxy far away. <laughs> and uh, because this week, Abel and I celebrate 18 years when he told me if I would like to be his novia. And I don't know if you know what that means, boyfriend and girlfriend. I have shared with you in the Hispanic culture, you become novios, then you get engaged, then you get married. So Abel didn't know anything about the novios part. I needed to subtle, softly say, by the way, I have some friends that became novios. And he's like, what's that? I'm like, praise God. So then I needed to explain. I said, well, it's when you start kind of dating and it's getting a little bit more serious because you start dedicating 
your life to spend more time with this person. And on parenthesis, and you need to ask permission to that, right? Because if not, this is going to get creepy very soon. So he's like, oh, I haven't done that. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know? So it was 18 years ago. And I can tell you that for me, has been one of the best thing in my life. For him, the most difficult sacrifice for these 18 years of his life. But um, what happened is in that moment, you say, you know, I'm going to be intentional in dedicating our time to pray together and to learn. Is this really what God is calling us to do? Is this something God is going to honor? Are we growing in our faith together? Or are we getting in the way? It's a very kind of, if if you take that seriously, it's a season of a lot of discerning, but a lot of dedicating. So what we are talking today is about that we are also called to be in a time of dedication. And the scripture in the Old Testament specifically explains of people who took this specific vow of dedication. And it is called the the Nazareth vow. Is that the way to pronounce it? Nazareth vow. It's kind of hard to say that, but um, it's an extraordinary opportunity of growth for many people. First of all, because this was something they wanted to do usually. The majority of the time is when they said, I want to take a time to really be intentional, to dedicate this to God. What is really incredible, specifically for the Old Testament, it was that it's something that men or women could do. And that's very unique. As you remember in the Old Testament, the majority were just on men. In this case, women could be part of that. And um, this is also for what is the equivalent of lay people. Usually the people that were recognized as dedicating their lives to God were the priests. But that one, you couldn't do anything to be able to be a priest unless you were part of a specific family, the Levites. They were the only ones capable to do that. So this is an option that you had if you wanted to dedicate your life. Also, usually it was temporary. It was not all your life. In some cases it was. And it ended always with an offering as a way to say, you know, I had this time. And then now I am ending this and I learned something new. There were three restrictions that they had at that time, but each restriction had a purpose. The first restriction was they could not drink anything that was wine or it was created with grapes or anything like that, just water at that point. The other thing that they couldn't do is they could not cut their hair. So they needed to have their hair long. And then you can remember that when you learn the story of Samson. And the other one is they could not be close to anything that was death. So those were three restrictions. What was the purpose of that? The purpose of this is that this is a person who's taking a specific decision. And by that is acting in relationship to say, I want to give my entire life to God. I want to take a time right now just to say, God, you are my God. And I want to grow in my faith. Another aspect of this too is if we can call somehow a person in this vow in the New Testament, it's a person who's a disciple. It's a person who says, I want to follow God. I want to know that I'm part of a bigger story than whatever happens to me in these 24 hours. I want to be part of the story that transformed the world because it's the story of God. Now, this is why the restrictions were important and the meaning of the restrictions. And I want you to listen to that because it's so easy that we misinterpret the scripture thinking that the Bible has just all these restrictions with no purpose, but each one has a specific purpose. The first one is why they couldn't drink any kind of wine is because it's a way that they can say, I am not from this world. Is to understand that your life here is, yes, maybe you can enjoy things that are in this world, but you know there is more than this. It's like when you take a time of fasting or in Lent when we do that. It's the way that you remember, I have more in my heart and in my mind than just whatever we do in this world. There is more, and I'm going to honor that. The second aspect is why they grow their hair is very important. It says, It's a way to be able to manifest to the people around them that they say, I want to be uh, to be recognized as a person that is walking with God. I belong to God and I don't care who sees that. It's like an intentional way to loudly say through their hair and the way they look like I belong to God. You see, I am in this place. And this I like this because 
right now I sense that sometimes the conflict that we have is understanding a difference between being humble and yes, it's important to be humble. And the scripture talks about that, specifically with the priests who were carrying all of these different things in their body. And um, they were doing that in an attitude of being snob. That's one thing. But then on the other hand, sometimes we get to an extreme of wanting to be humble that really nobody really knows that you are a person in a relationship with God. But what they are asking in here is no. They said there are times when you need to be bold in the way you are moving around in life, the way you just interact with people so they can see that your behavior and your attitude is different because God is in your life. So that's kind of what they are talking about. And then why they couldn't touch anything that was dead is mainly because during that time, if there was a funeral or there was an event of that kind with the family, they couldn't be close to that because it was a way to say, I am right now really intentionally spending time with God. So there was a purpose on that. Now, the Bible is telling us different people who also were in this vow, but they were not something they wanted. They did something that Pastor Sue White taught me. And she told me this word, voluntold. Have you heard that word before? If you do not know what is to be voluntold, talk to me at the end of the service, and I'll gladly show you how it works, right? Right, Tom White? <laughs> you know, so we just voluntold. Jim Ferguson is the one that he told me, sometimes they kind of push their hands on pastors to tell you to say yes, but softly, right, Jim? <laughs> okay, so there were two or three in the Bible, actually, who were voluntold to this, to this vow. Can you guess who they were? The first one, that's the easy one. That is Samson, yes. Then who else? Hmm? John the Baptist. Very good. Who said John over there in the back? All right. Of course, my sister. Yeah, John the Baptist. There was another one who was voluntold. You know who was it from the Old Testament? Samuel. So those are the three who were voluntold to be um, in this vow. Now, Samson, I want you to see a contrast specifically with Samson and John the Baptist. Both have exactly the same background. They were voluntold by their mom. It's very, you need to be careful. Whenever mom and God agree in something, watch out. You know, because the, it's powerful, that prayer. And I take it with my children. And like, I look, <laughs> Aiden is like, yes, I know. All right. Very good. But the thing is this, Samson and John had exactly the same background on that. But they act about it very different, very different. If you know the story of Samson, many times we enjoy telling the story to children and the guy who's very strong. But when you read a little bit deeper, what do we see? The guy was exactly right, creepy. He was just like nasty. He was absolutely a mess. He wasn't thinking with his brain. I mean, the guy was hormonal, a weird guy. We're in that sense. But what we see is also Samson came in a very difficult season of the people of Israel. They were in that judges, exactly as Brian was saying. In that season, they were in a cycle that was before there was a king, and they will go through this cycle of, you see, they were, Israel was uh, doing things against God. Then because of that, God is calling them, and so they are oppressed. After that, Israel repents. Then God brings a judge and their healing happening, peace comes. Then when the judge dies, they go back to the cycle. So that was what was going on and it was getting worse by the minute. And Samson was one of those judges who was coming to be able to bring hope to the people of Israel. Did God use him? Absolutely. God used him even when he wasn't 100% following God. But the, the consequences of his own life were very different because of that. When I was looking at some of the history of him and I was looking to some of these pictures, it touched my heart, this actor of this, of this movie, because um, he says that they invite him to be, be Samson and he was praying about it. And he told God, tell me if you want me to do this, God, in a way that I understand. And that Sunday he went to church and his pastor asked him to read the scripture. Guess why was it? It was judges. <laughs> and he was like, okay, God, I get it. I get it. You know, so it's a strong Christian man. But I think he defines the best what was going on with Samson. And I want you to see what he said. 
He says, Samson was a good man, but the root of his destruction is that he followed his passions instead of his responsibilities. I want you just to, to sink that a little bit in your head. Good man. We can say, I'm a good person. I am a person that is actually following God. I am here at church. I'm trying to grow my faith. But the root of the destruction is, what are we following? And that's exactly what's the difference between John the Baptist and Samson. What are you following? Whatever you see in front of you, or are you really intentionally in growing in your responsibilities? Now, I also want us to, to take another step about this. There are many times when we say, well, I cannot follow my responsibilities because it's the fault of my dad, my mother, my grandmother. We blame it on everyone around us. I don't, I do not deny that our past influenced who we are right now. It is true. But there is one point in our life when we need to take a decision and we need to say, okay, Yes, I had all this situation in the past. Yes, there were difficult chapters in my life. But there is a point when we need to come and agree. Am I going to allow those situations of the past shape who I am? Or am I taking responsibility and saying, God, I'm bringing you my past. I'm bringing you my present and my future so that from now on, whatever happened in my past is just part of my story, but not the definition of my eternal life. Does it make sense? So we need to get to that place. And in this case, we find Samson in like hormones, hormones. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the poor guy was just all over the place. I mean, he was a mess. I think that one of his problems was specifically he didn't understand boundaries. And guys, the society right now is telling us that boundaries are negative. And I disagree. I believe the opposite. Boundaries actually gives us freedom. The thing is that we say that boundaries are the ones who are not allowing us to go farther and actually it's the opposite. When you are living in the boundaries that God gave you, you can grow more as the person that God created you to be. If you step out of those boundaries, a lot of your life is going to be about fixing the consequences of those mistakes that you have been confronting. And let me tell you, in this place, we are a lot of us with experience doing that. Amen? And we are also a lot of here of us with the experience of understanding that when we repent and we come back to God, the Lord can take us again and he can put us back together so that we can be restored. Amen. So nobody is judging you here, but we encourage you do not get out of the boundaries because we know the consequence. So this is what was happening with, with Samson. He, I mean, honest to you, I, I shouldn't say the word stupid, but I'm thinking about it because it's like, okay, you have a woman who's trying to ask you, where do you get your strength? And you're telling her one time, and she tries that. Second time, and she tries that. When you stop, somewhere, right, you're like, really? Well, and he kept, he kept doing until this woman literally took his power. That in specific case of Samson, God was using a specific visual way of his strength. And that was what? His hair. Another moment was, when he got into wanting to marry this woman, he did. And then again, in the process, he got close to the uh, to a, a dead body of a lion. And then he's trying to make a riddle about it and see who gets that. I mean, like just pushing the boundaries, you see. And then, of course, the wife he had also is pushing with him. Tell me the answer of the riddle. He does. People don't know what is that. He gets angry leaves the wife, then he wants to come back and have his wife. The wife is already with another husband. He gets angry and he puts 300 foxes with fire and puts all the area of the Philistines on fire just because of anger. Do, do you realize, do you see what is going on with this guy? Very um, into reacting to his emotions. Whatever he had, that was what he felt. Now, we know a lot of people like that, except you. I'm sure that you say that's the other one. I know many, but not me. I get that. But also, I want you to see in the midst of that, this is God's mercy. The scripture says, he grew and the Lord what? Blesses him. In the midst of that, guys, the blessing of God is there. 
So you see, it's not that God is conditioning his blessing. He gives the blessing. The blessing is already there. The problem is you are not living the life that God gave you in its fullness because you're not living in that, in that boundary that God gave you. And it says, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And we can find God's mercy at the end when he's even in the re really last moment asking for repentance to do what God called him to do. And he does. He serves God. And he protects the people of Israel from the Philistines. But it took till the moment of his death to get that. Now, as a contrast, we have John the Baptist with the same call. But look how the mother receives the good news about him. The, the words were, he will be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. And what John the Baptist did was a powerful ministry. Was it easy? It wasn't easy, but it was powerful. The scripture says in Luke, I'm sorry, in Mark 1, 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness because he was on this vow, preaching a baptism of what? Repentance for the forgiveness of sin. What a beautiful ministry to go around and say, you know, there is one coming after me. He's the one we have been looking for. He's the Messiah. He's going to come. Get ready. Get ready. It was a beautiful ministry, but it's a contrast with Samson. So what we come to these places, to all of us to understand too, where are we on that dedication with God? Where, are, where is your story and my story? Romans 12, 1 says, I love this translation. Dear friends, what is the very first thing we need to remember? God is good. Can we all here proclaim that? God is good. In the good times, God is good. In the bad times, God is good. In the difficult times, God is good. In the moments of challenge, God is good. God is good. But then, because he's good, then this can happen. So, that's a consequence. I beg you to offer your bodies to him as living sacrifice, pure and pleasing, that the most sensible way to serve God. In other words, we are also called exactly as Samson and John the Baptist were, to take a decision. Do we want to dedicate our lives to Christ or not? And you know, right now in this precise moment, we can deny that our culture and our country's intention and elections are coming and people are getting angry and they are getting happy in politics. It's a lot of tension going on. And if we leave reacting to that tension, we are going to get overwhelmed. Even with our denomination, there are a lot of things going on that are bringing tension. And guys, if we're just reacting to every tension that we have or every moment of crisis, we're just going to collapse. So how do we handle this? We handle it by one specific direction. And that is that we need to dedicate our lives to the Lord. If we dedicate our lives, then we can listen to God. Then when we dedicate our lives, we are able to say, God, here I am, use me. And we dedicate our lives and we use our time to go with others and say, I really do not care if you are a rep Republican or Democratic. You are a person created in God's image. And I want to bring you a good news. God is good. That is more important than your party. That is more important if you're an immigrant or not. What's important is God is good and he wants to transform your life. And this truth is eternal and crosses boundaries and barriers. And you know, God is good even for those that I like. And God is good with those that I do not like. And praise the Lord for that. Because I'm sure that I am in the I don't like you list of many people. But with that, God is good to them too. And God is good to them with me. So where are we spending our time? In the fight, in the battle, in the crisis, or in focusing to say, I want to dedicate my life to Christ. I'm going to show you a video, probably of a team that you do not like. For sure, I know Herschel, you don't like this team. But I want you to hear this testimony of them. I can only give uh, the praise to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for giving me this opportunity. I mean, glory to God, first and foremost. We wouldn't be here without him. Unbelievable. All glory to God.
Separate journeys led them to the NFL and the Philadelphia Eagles. They sought an outlet to come together and created a way to share their faith. We're marching, We're marching, We're marching. We're marching. Chapel for us here is that in the NFL since our Sundays are taken up, you can't go to church. So you have the opportunity to attend chapel, which is like a small church service. And we're able to get our word in. Um, every Monday night, we have a, a couple's Bible study. We have a Thursday night team Bible study. And then Saturday nights, uh, we actually get together the night before the game and just kind of pray, talk through uh, the word, what guys have been reading, what they're struggling with, and just kind of keep it real with each other. To have that here in an NFL um, facility like this, it's, it's really special. How important is it for you to use your platform to glorify God? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. Um, our number one goal on this earth is to make disciples. Uh, that's the only job that we are pretty much, we want to do. Um, so faith in football this Sunday is huge. It's a platform that we have to draw people to the word, uh, to Jesus. Uh, it's something that we don't take for granted by any means. Uh, it's obviously responsibility, but we love that. The major thing I found out is they're regular people. I don't care how much money you give them, I don't care how much fame a person has. Um, if they don't know who they are inside, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> really what I preach to the players is that football is a platform. It's not your purpose. And the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. There we go. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Faith alone in Jesus is what leads to salvation, and then the works come out of your salvation. See, Christianity is the only religion in the world where you can't earn right standing with God. You can't earn heaven. You can't earn your afterlife. You can't earn good karma, whatever other religions think. It's the only religion in the world you can't earn it because it's already been earned. Jesus already earned it. It's all about accepting Jesus, and that's it. Don't miss that point. Don't miss that point. Don't miss that point.